One of the most perplexing of all psychological conditions is borderline personality disorder. Unable to find solutions to their myriad problems, these patients often resort to unpredictable and potentially dangerous actions. Are you feeling like killing yourself right this minute? These distorted beliefs and impulsive behaviors make this complex disorder extremely difficult to treat. Everyone agrees now, borderline personality disorder is itself a predictor of suicide. Marsha Linehan is director okay, of the so Suicidal Behaviors no Research there. Clinic You're at the University of Washington in Seattle where she is also professor of psychology and psychiatry. This is the problem. The emotional pain that they experience can't be reduced, has to be tolerated, and they cannot tolerate it. And that suicidal behavior is ultimately an attempt to change that pain and reduce it. Dr. Linehan recently published a book that outlines her approach to treating patients with borderline personality disorder. This program will present an overview of her treatment model, which Dr. Linehan calls Dialectical Behavior Therapy, or DBT. We will describe the main components of DBT, including a definition of dialectics, the goals of treatment, the various modes of therapy, and outcome data from a study Dr. Linehan conducted on the effects of DBT in the treatment of women who met criteria for borderline personality disorder. I was thinking that was the then, at the conclusion of the program, Dr. Linehan and Dr. Alan Francis, chairman of the DSM-4 task force, will discuss a number of issues concerning the treatment of these patients. The theoretical framework for understanding DBT is dialectics. Dialectics is a process of achieving balance. In DBT, synthesis, or balance, is sought on several levels. The desire for patients to change is balanced with acceptance of the patient's problems as they are. The goal of teaching patients how to solve their problems is balanced by the need to simultaneously validate those difficulties. A straightforward, somewhat irreverent attitude toward the patient's problems by the therapist is balanced by a reciprocal warmth and understanding. And finally, directly interceding in the patient's environment is balanced with teaching them how to interact on their own. Dr. Linehan's research on DBT is an ongoing process. Therefore, therapy sessions are always monitored. The purpose is to observe the behavior of the therapist and ensure adherence to the treatment manual. To illustrate Dr. Linehan's approach to treating borderline personality disorder, recreations and actual patient interviews will be used. However, to maintain patient confidentiality, the images have been electronically altered. What we've got to do is we have got to figure out a way, you and me, to change this behavior. I don't think I can change. Dialectical behavior therapy draws from traditional cognitive behavioral models, particularly those that emphasize change-oriented strategies. But in developing DBT, Dr. Linehan added an important element. When you approach people who meet criteria for borderline with a treatment that focuses exclusively in helping them change, what you find is that the individual is so sensitive to negative feedback and criticism, that their ability to change gets reduced and diminished and goes to almost zero if you come in with what I think of as a technology of change. Well, I know it's going to be really hard, but between the two of us, we are going to have to do it. Throughout the entire treatment, what I've done is gone to other treatment approaches besides uh, behavior therapy and looked for what I now think of as a technology of acceptance. And so what we, I brought in was acceptance-based treatment strategies, blended them in with change-based strategies. And so the treatment now is really defined as the balance of acceptance and change.
let's see, your boyfriend starts a fight, you lose it, he walks out, you decide it's over, decide to kill yourself, walk into the bathroom, pick up your pills, take them all, and practically die. In DBT, the objective is to address the behavioral characteristics typically found in patients who meet criteria for borderline personality disorder. The treatment itself is based on, the, on several kind of interrelated sorts of ideas. The first idea is that people who meet criteria for borderline have skills deficits or capability deficits, that they don't have the ability to engage in the behaviors that they need to to solve their problems. What I'm thinking is that what we have to do is teach you something new to do. What do you think? I think that would help. You want to learn something new? Yeah. Okay. I have to. Well, I agree with that. The second is that the individual, even when they have the capabilities, often is, does not use those capabilities because of motivational factors. So they're inhibited. Um, they're being punished for being skillful and rewarded for, say, suicidal behavior, for example. Or they have faulty beliefs. And so we have a whole component where the real function of the component is to focus in on motivational factors. Well, at home, no one pays any attention to me. People just tell me to shape up. At least in the hospital, people take me seriously. So one of the things that's going on here is that if you try to kill yourself or say you're going to try to kill yourself, that's the effect of that is that other people take you seriously. Yeah. Okay. It's the only way they'll take me seriously. Huh. This, of course, is the problem. People take you seriously in the hospital. And being taken seriously is a reinforcer for you, I'm almost sure. It's a reinforcer for most people. And so if you get taken seriously every time you say you're going to kill yourself or when you do try to kill yourself and you don't get taken seriously any other time, you can count on it you're going to keep threatening or keep trying to kill yourself. That's just the way it works. The third assumption is that the individual um, needs help taking what they learn within a treatment program and applying it in their everyday world. And that, that a lot of uh, treatment programs fail because they don't pay enough attention to getting the behaviors learned in therapy into the real world where they've got to have them. And so we have a component whose aim is to provide coaching in use of new behaviors in the everyday environment. And in at least the treatments that we've researched today, that has always been done with telephone calls to the individual therapist. Although one could do that with case management, milieu treatment, and a lot of other things. I don't see what good learning these skills does. I mean, it's like I'm learning to be the perfect patient, but I still can't function outside. It's like I get into a crisis and I still can't do anything. Well, listen, that is the point of the phone calls. The whole point is for you to call me and then I'm going to do some coaching with you on the phone so you can practice the skills out there because I completely agree with you. It doesn't do you any good to be a perfect patient. The goals of treatment then are to bring about both change and acceptance by replacing maladaptive and ineffective behaviors with appropriate and effective ones and to improve the patient's motivation to change. In DBT, treatment takes place in several different contexts. These include individual psychotherapy, group skills training, telephone consultation, consultation meetings for therapists, as well as ancillary treatments, including pharmacotherapy, inpatient care, day treatment, case management, and support groups such as 12-step programs. These different modes of therapy each function in specific ways. For example, each patient has an individual psychotherapist who is also the primary therapist for that patient on the DBT treatment team. 
The role of the individual therapist is to first orient the patient to the therapy and have the patient agree on treatment goals even before therapy begins. You do realize that if you don't drop out for a year, that really does, if you think about it logically, rule out suicide for a year. Logically, yeah. But since when is suicide logical? <laughs> That's part of the reason we're having this conversation, is to try to structure our relationship so that it's very clear for both of us. And that way, at least, you will try to cut down on how much you get overwhelmed by not knowing what's going on with me. Right. Okay? Uh -huh. Then the therapist should target all life-threatening behaviors. Now, one of my goals that we need to get agreement on is that we're kind of independent of what your mood is, that you won't try to kill yourself again. Mm -hmm. That, to me, is kind of the most fundamental mood-related behavior we had to work on, is that no matter what your mood is, right? You won't kill yourself, or try to. Right. Next, address problems that affect quality of life, teaching coping skills to use in place of habitual dysfunctional behaviors. So one of the tasks for you and me would be to figure out a way to get your behavior and what you do less hooked up with how you feel. Right. I think we could deal with it, but I think it's going to be hell. And, and the real question is whether you're willing to go through hell to get where you want to get or not. Now, I figure that's the question here. Well, if it's going to make me happier, yeah. You sure? Yeah. Okay. That's good, though. See, that's going to be your strength. We're going to play to that. That's, that's our friend, this desire to live. You're going to have to remember that when it gets hard. Therapy interfering behaviors by the patient or the therapist must also be attended to. We've already talked about suicidal behavior. Now, the second really important thing in psychotherapy with anyone, and in particular in this therapy, is going to be for you and I to spend whatever amount of time we have to working on our relationship. And what, what I mean by that is that we're going to work on any of your behavior that creates problems in therapy. And just as important, we're going to work on any of my behavior. So if you do something that creates a problem for me or for the therapy, I'll bring it up if you don't bring it up first. But if I do something that creates a problem for you or for the therapy, then you bring it up if I don't bring it up first. And then we'll work on that. Because the whole idea is that you and I, we have to work together well. And finally, efforts are made to generalize these skills into daily life. Now you're already ahead of the game because you agreed last week not to kill yourself before this week and here you are alive. Yep. So you did that? Yeah. Is it hard? Yeah. That's good. Now we know you can do hard things. The heart of individual psychotherapy is the application of DBT's core strategies, validating the patient's problems, while at the same time trying to teach the patient how to solve those problems. You have to choose whether you're going to focus on it completely and feel really bad whether you're going to do some distractions. In most therapies, validation involves concepts such as empathy, listening, and reflecting back. But in DBT, validation has additional meaning. DBT does all of that. But it adds on one thing that is not as often talked about in other treatments, which I call validation in terms of the present. And that's the requirement within every interaction that the therapist search for the grain of wisdom or the grain of truth in the patient's response in the moment. So that's the response where the therapist is looking for and commenting upon something about what the patient's saying that makes sense in terms of the present. I don't like myself when I get angry. I don't like it when I end up attacking a friend of mine. Well, I can sure understand that. I mean, I can understand not liking that. I mean, I hated myself for it. Hmm. So, you're hating yourself for getting angry? Losing it. Not just, not just getting angry, but really losing it. Hmm. Well, I gotta agree with you. It does sound like knocking your friend to the ground is losing control. So you fell out of control when you did it? Yeah. Any other feelings that you're having? No. So how'd you get from there to strangling yourself? 
That's what I don't understand. Because it works. For what? Makes me feel better? Hmm. Well, I can see how it does that. It's kind of like taking a sleeping pill, isn't it? I mean, it makes you unconscious. Yeah. This gets misconstrued constantly by people who try to learn this therapy into thinking that if you ever invalidate behavior, you're not doing the treatment. So the idea is not to validate the invalid. It should be sort of paternalistic if you didn't. The idea is to find the valid. So it's based on the premise that it's there and that you can find it. And so far, I've been at this for quite some time. I have to say, when I've looked, I have found it. In DBT, validating the patient's problems is balanced by teaching the patient how to go about solving them. And in problem solving is included, first, the notion of behavioral analysis, which is a very in-depth, moment to moment, second to second, analysis of the chain of responses that led up to problematic behavior. And so it's essentially the therapist trying to make sense with the patient of the patient's behavior. You had urges to hurt yourself really starting on Wednesday, huh? Mm-hmm. Do you know what set him off on Wednesday? It began to hurt. So you started having a lot of pain. Now, when did you start having the pain and when did the urge to harm yourself come? Same time. They just come at, at, at identical moments? Just about. So how is it that feeling pain sets off an urge to pain? Do you know how that goes? How you get from one to the other? I believe firmly that if I'd gotten pain medication when I really needed it, I wouldn't have even thought of self-harming. You know, you are not the first person I've ever met. But if something hurts and no one will help them, they make it hurt more. It's kind of perverse logic. Especially when it doesn't work. Let's imagine for the moment that you and I are on a raft together out in the middle of the ocean. Our boat has sunk. We're on the raft. And when the boat sunk, your leg got cut really badly. We have no pain medicine. And we're on this raft together, and your leg really hurts, and you ask me for pain medicine, and I say no. Do you think that you would then have an urge to hurt yourself, make it worse? If you had the pain medication? No, I don't have any pain medication. No, it would be a different situation. Okay, but if I did have the pain medication, I said, no, we have to, we have to save it and only have one a day. What do you think? If that were logical to me, I'd go along with it. No, you, you, wouldn't want, you wouldn't want to hurt yourself? No. What if I said no because I don't want you to be a drug addict? Want me to hurt myself. Okay. So we've got this clear. So actually, you're hurting yourself is communication behavior. Okay? So what we have to f do is figure out a way for the communication behavior to quit working. Why? Because if it, if it doesn't, it, you're not going to stop doing it until it quits working. Balancing that is what we call solution analysis. And solution analysis is the therapist trying to help the patient figure out what they could have done different. So it's it's... It's like if you were driving from Seattle to Florida, but you ended up in New York. Behavioral analysis is trying to figure out how in the world you ended up in New York. Where did you make the wrong turns? And solution analysis is trying to figure out how, what you could have done to get to Florida. So that's, that's basically what it is. You see, what I think is happening is that when you're in a lot of pain and you feel either not cared about or not taken seriously, invalidated, that's what sets you up to hurt yourself. And I also want to die. And that what we need to do is figure out a solution to that problem so that there are other ways to get out besides hurting yourself or trying to kill yourself. So that's the main part. Uh, then you have to add on to that sort of a commitment to go to Florida. So if you end up in New York and you figure out how to go to Florida, it's not very useful if you can't get the person to agree that the next time they get in the car, they are going to Florida. And so that's the sort of ending part. So you analyze it, you figure out a solution, then you get a commitment at the end. At times, Dr. Linehan's response to the patient may seem blunt and somewhat irreverent. I've been going through this since I was 11 years old. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm sick of this shit. Either I need to do this or I need to die. 
Mm -hmm. Those are my two choices. Well, why not die? Well, if it comes down to it, I will. Mm -hmm. But why not now? But this is not a matter of personal style. In fact, it is a planned part of dialectical behavior therapy. What DBT says is that a therapist needs to balance their styles. No matter what your personal style is, the irreverent style uh, combines a number of things. Part of it combines just a lot of confrontation, bluntness, calling a spade a spade, and being direct. And if you try being very direct with borderline patients, you'll be amazed because they almost always love it. They'll almost always tell you they really appreciate it. This is what people tell us all the time. So that's, um, that's, the, that's the confrontation that's part of irreverence. Now, the other part of irreverence is uh, it's hard to describe in words. It's the off-the-wall part of it. It's the sort of being outrageous. It's the where you don't exactly censor everything. And it is the attempt of the therapist to sort of push the patient into some other way of thinking. So it's a, a lot of use of paradox, uh, taking small parts of what the patient says, maybe and exaggerating them, or picking up a part that they didn't want you attending to and attending to it, uh, et cetera. Kind of the most fundamental mood-related behavior we had to work on is that no matter what your mood is, right, you won't kill yourself or try to. I agree with that. Why would you agree to that? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, wouldn't you rather be in a therapy where if you could, if you want to kill yourself, you can? I don't know. I mean, I don't, I've never really thought of it that way. That, though, can very easily become mean-spirited, be used against the patient, be sarcastic, and be used to justify no end of troublesome behaviors. So, balancing that is what I call reciprocal communication. And um, reciprocal communication also has a lot of parts to it, but the main part of reciprocal communication is an emphasis first on warmth and genuineness. Um, and responsivity of the therapist. So it's much like being vulnerable, which also a lot of other therapists have talked about, interestingly. Jung talked a lot about the necessity of a therapist being vulnerable. And being vulnerable means that you had to be touchable, you had to be pushable, you had to be movable. The, the patient has to be able to influence you by what they do. I, and I don't know how you can learn this. It's, it's intuitive or something or other. Being irreverent is not easy to accomplish. Now, Such a direct I style like may not be part of a therapist's that. training or personality. I tell teams all the time that the way to learn irreverence, if you're not irreverent, is to find the person in your group who's naturally irreverent because there's always somebody who's this way by birth. And whoever it is, then you listen to every irreverent thing they say, and you have to get them to tell you all the irreverent stuff. And then you imitate them. I like the style of DBT. I think I'll have to work at it some. It's, it's irreverence is something that will take a, um, a lot of being able to relax with people. I think that that takes a certain confidence that I'm still building um, in, in doing therapy with people. But I think that it will open up for me a lot of room to be more of who I am because I find myself being that way more with um, people naturally. And, and I think it opens up a lot of freedom to move with with patients that I didn't feel like that I had so much before. You're dancing with your client the whole time, and so um, it, it keeps you real focused. So, you, you know, you know when you're on one side of the dialectic that quickly you're going to be moving, and so intellectually it's, it, you know, it's very satisfying. Um, and and it, it's fun. I mean, it's a fun thing to do. Individual therapy focuses on motivational issues. However, group sessions are used to enhance social capabilities through psychoeducational skills training. A lot of times I, I could get so like anxious about something that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I just blank out or something, you know. Mm -hmm. At that point, appearing confident seems almost like... Uh, it seems like the hardest thing to do, yeah. Yeah, I mean... That might be something that you need to practice more. The goal of skills training is to replace the negative emotions, beliefs, and behaviors.